John Dagdalin here with us. He's um, uh, currently a grad student at uh, UC Berkeley and here at the lab working in Kristen Persons group. Did his undergrad at UC Berkeley, works in materials and uh, engineering as well as undergrad. Is that right? Uh, so he's going to talk about some natural language processing stuff. Um, I feel like I have to read this quote at the end of your bio, oh, sure, or yeah. is that part of your talk? Am I going to no, say I, I don't under? have that in the slides. That's the <laughs> when asked, okay, so they're preparing machine learning stuff for, you know, um, going through materials literature, right? When asked about the meaning of life, his team's AI trained on material science research papers and funded, the meaning of life is to prepare stable, sustainable materials that function well. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I come from a different side of the world from a lot of people who talked about today's seminar. So I'm really happy to be able to share kind of maybe a new perspective on, on what some of the, the infrastructure that NERSC has built is, is doing and also uh, what we are doing in, in NLP for materials discovery. Um, so my background is materials uh, design. So the, all of the technologies that are around us, they're built out of stuff. Right. And in my experience, the, the creativity of engineers is pretty much unlimited. They can create a space elevator to the moon if you, if you gave them uh, enough money and the, the right time. But there's no materials that could facilitate that invention yet. Um, so pretty much a lot of the, the technological developments that we see in society, they're usually uh, preceded by a fundamental breakthrough in materials science. Um, so some examples for this. Uh, the, the very high efficiency uh, turbine engines that are starting to be built, um, those depend on new materials like ceramics that can uh, sustain uh, forces that otherwise would break other ceramics or the, high, the, the uh, super alloys that, that don't stretch as much as they, they're uh, under tension in high temperatures. Uh, similarly, battery technologies have, have made really big leaps in recent years. And from that, we, it's become fun, uh, feasible to make uh, electric vehicles with enough range to to um, get you where you need to go. And also in, in flexible solar cells, those are, those are driven by materials advances and things like catalysis, so the, the catalyst we use to, to turn uh, gases into useful molecules and polymers and that kind of stuff. So uh, we have a big incentive to develop new materials and make discoveries in this area. Uh, but the problem is that it takes about 20 years or so to go from a working material in the lab to a material that is in uh, a, a product that you can buy. So speeding up this process is really important to us. Um, we've, as a materials research community, we've uh, started trying to accelerate this process uh, by creating big databases of simulated materials data, materials property data. Um, and one of them is here at LBNL, the materials project. But there are other similar uh, data, data sources, uh, like the OQMD. Um, but generally, these are uh, starting to be used as the sources for materials informatics projects, uh, because you have big uh, amount of structured data online. Um, also, if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to ask and I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but the, the issue that we have right now is although these, these sources of data are, are great and, and available to us, they don't represent the true amount of materials knowledge that we have. And so we're, we're leaving a lot on the table by not using the knowledge that we've built over, over centuries of materials research. Um, and most of the knowledge that we, we have is actually unstructured text and tables and figures and papers that uh, is right now, it's, it's not very accessible to machine learning and, and data informatics uh, approaches. So our project, uh, we're calling it Math Scholar. Uh, we've got a website going now uh, with some web apps that you can try out. Um, and it has two, two arms to it. The first is supervised natural language processing. Uh, so we're trying to extract useful data out of these, these papers and then make that available as a structured database that people can do things like machine learn on. Um, and then we also have a branch uh, which is uns unsupervised natural language processing. So just what can you learn from the unstructured data itself? And uh, I'll talk about this in the second part of the talk, but we, we've been using scientific word embeddings and creating language models trained on scientific corpora uh, to, to make fundamental breakthroughs in, in materials actually. So the first, the first part of the talk, we'll just talk about the NLP, uh, the, the NER um, pipeline that we've developed. So for those of you that aren't so familiar with this area of machine learning, uh, NLP is a branch of machine learning that deals with understanding human language uh, in machines. So as, as a person, I can communicate to you very easily with, with spoken words, or I can write something down and give it to you. 
But computers have a much harder time understanding the meaning and intention of, of things like that. And they, uh, until we've, we've built methods for computers to understand text, it's just represented essentially as a stream of characters. And it's not really that descriptive unless you understand language itself um, and, and are able to extract meaning from those, those sources of information. And so NLP is, is driven to understand and extract useful information from the way that humans communicate to each other. And that is important in our field because the way that we communicate science to each other is generally through natural language and not through these databases that would be uh, very useful. So we have funding from the Toyota Research Institute uh, across the Bay in Palo Alto. And we've collected about four and a half, uh, almost five million full text papers from different journals, uh, all in the physical sciences. And about two million of those or so are materials science specific or inorganic materials. We have a lot of uh, papers on polymers and biomaterials as well that we're uh, starting to process. So this is an example of the kind of task that, oh yeah, sure. Uh, just a quick question, what years were those papers from? Okay, the question was, uh, for those on the, on the call, what years are those papers from? Generally, they range from between like 1950 to present day. Uh, it, it really depends on uh, papers that are very highly cited and very uh, highly read from farther back. Those get digitized more often. So, so generally, we rely on, on what people have digitized at, and done uh, optical character recognition on. So the journal is what they have uh, made available in a digital form. Yeah, so not, we're not, we're not uh, doing OCR on PDFs just yet. Uh, so this is the task that we're trying to solve. Um, so as a, as a materials researcher, I have an idea of what, what it means to be a material, what it means to have a property, those kind of things. Um, and we'd like to be able to create a database of this information. But to do that, you need to essentially go through raw text and apply labels to words. So in this case, gallium nitride is a material. Thin film describes that sample that was being discussed in the paper. Um, and then it's maybe used as a laser diode. So these are, these are labels that we want to apply to these words. Um, and the question is, how do, you, how do you actually do this? So we've developed a, um, a framework for actually going through and uh, taking just the, the, the raw source of information out, out on the web and then bringing it into a database. And so this is an example. We have some piece of text that came from a paper on the, online. We're storing all of that in a database together. And we, we normalize our representations in metadata so everything is sort of consistent. So whether it came from nature or it came from El Sevier, those all come to the same sort of representation and we can start doing machine learning on. Um, the first step that we have to do though is we have to split up that stream of characters into what are called tokens. So tokens are just a one or two or three, uh, you can have multi multiple word tokens, but they just represent a single chunk of information that you wanna classify. So it's sort of you're abstracting the stream of characters into words uh, as humans would think about it. Then what we do is we, we built a tool that uh, allows us to go and hand label these, these uh, abstracts. So we started with abstracts because they contain sort of the, the meatiest part of the paper and the meatiest uh, chunk of information. They're generally written in a very easy to understand way and sort of standardized. So, and also they're very easy to get. So we went through about a thousand abstracts as material science experts. And we applied our labeling to those as to, to create a, a set of training data. Um, and then we split that into a few different types of, uh, or a few different um, sets so that we could train our, our algorithms and then test them on separate data to make sure that we weren't overfitting to whatever data we had initially fed it. We have a separate test set that we can report results on. Uh, we trained a, a couple different machine learning models. One I'll talk about in a little bit, um, that word to vec, but we, we got some sort of numerical vectorized representation of the words in our set, fed those to an LSTM, uh, and then that is what actually applied the labels. And then what you essentially have now is a machine learning model that you can run in parallel on millions of documents that was sort of uh, leveraging the intelligence of one material science PhD. And you can then distribute it across millions and millions of documents and get the same, uh, almost the same results. So quantitatively, uh, we have F1 scores of about uh, 90, which is uh, pretty good. It's a re it's a, for those that aren't familiar with that metric, it's sort of a, a measure of um, how many false positives and how many false negatives are you getting, right? If you have uh, an unweighted data set where 90% of your words in it are not, a, not an entity, not a token we care about, uh, the algorithm could get very high accuracy by just saying this is not a material for every word, but that wouldn't be correct. So we're, we're doing very well uh, in terms of actually getting the real, uh, the real labels on words. And so you can actually try this yourself. So we've, we've built a web application at mattscholar.com. Uh, and you, we have a, a little app where you can paste in any text you'd like uh, and then actually extract the materials entities from it. It works much better when you actually give it a paper on inorganic material science, uh, which is sort of where, what we trained it on. 
Um, but we are branching out into to new models and polymers and that kind of thing soon. Uh, we're also getting property values and property units, and uh, we're, we're working on now creating a structured database of the, the numerical data from these, these abstracts. Um, Question. Sure, yeah. Uh, in your, this material, this, like the label of a material, did, where the, is, does it find out labels in materials that are not hand labeled by you guys as part of the material? Or does it figure out that uh, if you have LI, LA, NIO, and then it somehow figures out something LA, SIO, something, mm -hmm. does it still figure that out on its own, or do you have to hand label these parts? Yeah, so, so it can, it, it doesn't depend on the, um, it, it can it can find out of vocabulary words like you're talking about okay. based on the grammatical structure of the sentence, right? So if you said um, we measured the band gap of blank, a materials researcher would pretty much always say there's probably a material coming next because that's sort of it's clued in by the the way that the um, the language is being used. So and the a vocabulary under materials increase as you train well, more and more. Yeah, yeah. So so. Uh, the accuracy is going to be higher for words that were in the vocabulary that the model was trained on uh, because we have word embeddings for those. But as we get more data, we're, we're rerunning these, these models and like continuously training them so that they improve. But it is able to get out of vocabulary words based on the context that they're coming from. Um, and that's because we use a sequence model. Uh, so it looks at forward and backwards, uh, the language that was used before the token and after the token, uh, it's able to make a judgment about whether that should have a label of some kind. Yep. And so is it like because of the tokenization, you're not actually using the like structure of the word itself, like the like the chemicals have like a capitalization pattern that's different, but that's not part of the information. So the question was, are we using the, the actual information about the, the, the structures of the tokens? Uh, like so a chemical formula might have uh, multiple characters that are capitalized and underscore and capitalized. Um, right now we're not using that, but we've actually built a, uh, a parser. Uh, for for materials so that we actually normalize them to the same format as well, um, yeah. So so you can you can but you can build models that are token by or by character by character applying those those labels. Um, I didn't implement the NER model myself, so actually we might now be using some token or some character level um, information in the this format of the word. Um, I can I can double check for that on, uh, with the Anya. It does it does often improve the. Um, the performance when you do something like that. So we may have, we may have implemented that. Um, we also have kind of a fun little uh, toy that is starting to become useful. Um, it's, we don't have every single journal yet, uh, so it might not give you uh, perfect results, but you can paste your abstract of a paper you're writing right now in, in material science, and then actually ask for suggestions of where you should submit it. So we trained a model to, to <coughs> label uh, a piece of text with what journal it was actually published in. And so now you can get sort of suggestions about where it might be, uh, might be uh, published. And it, it, the results are, are, are pretty, pretty decent. Like that, you wouldn't be out of your mind to, to submit to those journals. So it might help you discover a better journal for your, for your papers. OK, so, so these are sort of the results so far on um, the, the NER. We have about 4 million um, abstracts and full papers that we're starting to, to process. Um, from that, we have like many tens of millions of, of these new data points that weren't previously accessible to materials researchers. So we have 30, 30 odd million properties, uh, 20 mil million materials mentions. And so this is sort of a new paradigm for creating data that the materials informatics community has, has to work with. Um, and if you're interested in any of the, the implementation details of this model, um, you can read in this paper that we published in the Journal of uh, Chemical Information Modeling earlier this year. And the, the lead author of that, he was a postdoc here at LBNL, Lee Weston, uh, in Anubhav Jain's group. And uh, now he's at medium.com and he's working on uh, producing better subscription or better suggestions of what articles you should read into arts data science and stuff. So, very smart guy. Um, but what happens when you have this data? So, the Materials Project is, is, has about 100,000 users now. Um, and they're driven by this uh, being able to access materials data and also do useful things with it. So, what useful things can you do when you have? all of the entities labeled in, in about uh, a few million papers. So this is one example. Uh, this is an early version of our, our site, uh, the, the uh, prototype of it. And, and what you see here is we put a materials formula in and we search for it. And then we're able to get a sort of uh, snapshot of all of the research interest in that material across the entire body of materials literature that we have in our, in our corpus. So this is a, a kind of interesting multi ferroic material that was recently um, got a lot of uh, research interest. You can see the number of papers being published about it spike after the, the year it was first 
discovered to have this interesting property. Um, and also the, the properties that are most studied about it are magnetization, it's magnetic properties. Um, it, what is it used for in the application column? You can see it's, a it's maybe used in heterostructures uh, or as a photocatalyst. Um, the phase that it's found in, it's, it's a perovskite structure. And also it's typically uh, grown as a thin film. Uh, and then how, do, how would you grow it? So there, there's information about its synthesis and also what methods people use to understand that material and characterize it. So as a graduate student, this is a very useful uh, thing to, for me to be able to do because I'm coming from a place of little knowledge and now I can leverage the, the experience and knowledge of many, many researchers to get a better sense of, of where to go. So this is sort of alluding to how I think that AI is gonna be used uh, in the future in our field. It's gonna, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna augment the abilities of researchers to ask questions that they couldn't ask before. Like, has somebody made anything similar to what I'm interested in, and how did they synthesize it? That's previously a question that would take a lot of literature review, but we may be soon on the verge of being able to answer that, like a single Google query. Could, could there be, like, issues of um, unintended correlations, though, in this? Because maybe a material just happened to appear in papers connected to other materials, and a lot of the properties that are showing up in the tables are actually properties of the others, and there's some weird reason, maybe, like, the field was... I don't know, kind of thinking there was a connection between these for a while and it turned out that there wasn't, but now you get this kind of misleading, misleading results. Like yeah, yeah, so that's an important uh, aspect that, that we are trying to consider when we um, do this kind of work, <coughs> is that the, the models that you train will learn the inherent structure of the data that you give it. And if humans have bias, which we, we all do, that structure is gonna be represented in your model. Um, and so, the, in the case of this, uh, we're looking just at, at co-occurrence and abstracts in this, this, this prototype, but we are developing models that are able to uh, link entities together and give sort of an ownership of a property to a material. So even if uh, a material that is typically grown on a certain substrate is measured to have a property, that substrate is not going to be associated with that property. We're also moving into more advanced language models that will start updating their beliefs as it sees more information. So. It might see lots of papers in, uh, earlier that, that say this material has this property. And then later on, as more data comes in, it's going to learn that there's like some subtlety there because people start using language differently around that material. So uh, you can sort of test this a little bit. We've done some experiments with rerunning these, these uh, models on like different snapshots of the data and seeing how relationships between things change. It seems sort of stochastic right now. So if you just, uh, there's, there's not like that clear of a trend in a lot of the way the, the the connections that you made between concepts. Um, it seems to, to uh, we, we don't see like a very smooth transition between different snapshots of that, da that data, but that's something that we're interested in learning more about. There's another question here. Yes, how about, it may be for the future, but how are you QAing the articles which you are ingesting? Mm. You know, and I have in mind bad actors. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to skew for many of the papers. But yeah. just to give an example, there is some very interesting material recently discovered, and some entity would like to hide its meaning from the community. Mm -hmm. It published a false data which would skew it to the way which makes it less valuable. Mm -hmm. And then people would not experiment with it. Yeah, that's a question I've thought a lot about too. Um, because uh, the, the, the question was uh, what happens if you have people who are publishing data that may not be true? or maybe intentionally misleading. Um, so the, one, of the, one of the things you get to benefit from is that you can use lots and lots of examples of a certain information to try to make a judgment on that. So you sort of can, if you distribute across multiple research groups who are working on that material, you're much less likely to be able to have a, like they're not all gonna be consistent in how they're misleading. Uh, likely one group might mislead, but the others will publish something else, right? So that's one thing you need to rely on is, is don't weight individual data points too highly. You need to learn from the aggregate uh, about things. So in our cases, we often uh, will, uh, from our models, we won't train word embeddings on a single document, for example. So if a material has only been mentioned in one document, we don't actually let that into our training set for the <coughs> materials vocabulary and that kind of thing. Um, and then this is also a, a, a thing that I've thought about in terms of could we train models to identify situations where that might be the case? Maybe they report synthesis conditions that aren't consistent with what we would expect. Maybe you can flag those things and then bring them cl to closer attention with researchers. So this might actually be a tool that people can use to, to uh, defend against those, those situations as well. Um, 
So if you have a statistical distribution of, of the temperatures that people use to fire a certain material, and then a similar material is reported but not in that distribution, they may be intentionally trying to mislead people and not be able to make that so that they can't find similar thing, your uses for that material, I don't know. Um, so it's that, a comp hmm? But doesn't that bias your data set essentially then to solve problems? Yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, good question that we've, we, we've got from a lot of places. And I, I, I will show you in, uh, in a little bit that uh, it may not. Um, so, oh yeah, one more question. Yeah. Um, so you, you alluded to this when you're talking about like using more advanced language models, but um, often cases there are controversial materials where um, you know everyone will think that this material has a certain property. And then so the big paper will be that it does not have this property. Yeah. How it is, how is negation handled? So in those more advanced language models, uh, the, the models can pay attention to the actual way that words are used. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing the, the, the language modeling um, in a couple slides. But uh, in that case, when a material is found not to have that property, subsequent slurry of papers will start publishing about this and why it doesn't. And, and maybe that our, our understanding of this class of materials is different. So, so sudden, the, the language model will be able to start picking up on that. Um, so. The, the models that can pay, pay attention to the words outside of just the co-occurrence probabilities, but also the order in which they occur, and also whether or not is in between them. Yeah. Um, that is based on uh, basically looking at all of the words together and how they're used, and then those feed into the, the models, and then it makes more intelligent decisions about what it is understanding from that text. Rather than just a bag of words, you have actual information about the sequence and existence and not of, of negation and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, let me, let me get into the, the unsupervised NLP, which, which we'll cover a little bit of that. Um, so unsupervised NLP is where you have data, but you don't have some human judgment on it yet, or you don't have labels for that data. So in our case, we have all of these, these words in our corpus, and we'd like to learn what is the meaning of these words without actually going in and, and a human saying the word lithium cobalt oxide is a battery cathode material, and has this chemical structure and has this property, that's, that's not feasible for any human or even group of humans to do. So we want to do this in an unstructured way. Um, so uh, about six years ago, Google published a paper that um, when, I, when I first read it, when I first learned about this method, it gave me chills. Like, this was really, really exciting to me. Um, they published a technique to turn words into vectors of numbers that preserved the human intuition about how these words are used and analogies uh, in mathematical form. So uh, this is a technique to, to turn the language that we use and to communicate to each other into a form that machine learning models can now, can now understand, which is uh, essentially usually vectors of numbers. Um, so the, the famous example that they, they show in their paper is that if you take the word embedding, the word vector for Paris, you subtract the one for France, and you add the one for Italy, the resulting vector that you get out of doing that vector uh, subtraction and addition operation is really, really close in that vector space to the one for Rome. So just by looking at the, the, data, the structure of the data itself, it, it was able to create uh, representations for words that preserve their meaning as humans understand it. Um, and how does it do this? So this is a really, I think this is a really interesting technique that uh, inspires a lot of creativity uh, in the machine learning community. And people are actually starting to do this for more than just text in the materials informatics community. Um, but let's say we wanted to just slide a window across a piece of text and then take the word in the center and from that word, predict whether the words in its context are there or not. So this is, this is you could do this with a variety of different models, but a neural network, a very simple neural network can do. And so given the word fox, what is the probability that the word quick or jump or brown occurs in the context of that word? So as humans, we sort of have this innate understanding that similar words will be used in similar contexts. So the word for cat and the word for dog will be used in similar contexts of pets and food and uh, vet veterinarians and that kind of stuff uh, in the context of human pet. So if you can train a neural, neural network to make similar judgments for, for words in similar contexts, it will create a similar representation for similar words. So that's the, the key insight behind word to vector. Um, so when you, when you do this, what you do is you feed a one hot encoded vector into a very sim simple neural network with one hidden layer. Uh, and that, that one hot encoded vector essentially just selects a row of that matrix that you are training the weights for. And from that, you, you can actually extract a word embedding from that. So, so the, the problem you're actually trying to solve uh, is 
give this model the unstructured data, have it try to reconstruct the data from, it, from itself, and then predict a probability distribution of the words that should occur in this context. So this is the skip gram uh, variant of word -Dibec that I'm describing. And when you do this on the text of scientific articles in material science, what you're trying to do is essentially recreate the abstracts in the, the language they're using. So if you're, if you're asking it, what words should occur in the context of a material, often that's gonna be their properties, how they're, they're, what, what their applications are, um, how they were synthesized, that, those kind of things. And so uh, if you look at the words that are in this 200 dimensional high, high dimensional vector space that are most similar to lithium cobalt oxide, which is a really fundamental uh, <coughs> lithium ion battery material, um, which, which is the, the breakthrough that John Goodenough won the Nobel Prize for this year. Uh, the other material or the other, the other materials that are closest in that vector space, that word, the other, the other words actually, are lithium manganese oxide, lithium nickel oxide. These are all lithium ion battery cathode materials. So, so the words in this high dimensional vector space cluster according to how they're used, like what applications they're used for in, in engineering uh, uh, contexts. Similarly, the properties of materials will cluster with other, materi other properties of materials that have very similar uh, origins and, and meanings. So ferro ferromagnetic and ferrimagnetic are very close in this vector space. So you can start thinking about how, how might these uh, this vector space represent the knowledge that we've collected over many years in the materials research community. Um, you, can, you can plot these uh, in a big kind of cluster map using a, a, a method that takes this high dimensional vector space and try to map it to two dimensional uh, plane in a way that sort of preserves the structure of that higher dimensional vector space is called TSNE. But what you can see here, we took all of the, I think the top you know, 2000 materials or so and we projected it onto this, this two-dimensional vector space, and they're clustering with their properties and their, uh, their uses. So photovoltaics will cluster together, superconductors, piezoelectrics, uh, organic materials. Um, and so this has some really interesting implications for what, can you, what information can you learn from this large aggregation of data, not just the specific uh, abstracts, but in general, um, are there larger emergent trends that we're missing because we can't read 200,000 papers a year like this, this model uh, can read all of them. And if you actually look in the, the, this latent space, uh, there, there are directions that allow you to make sort of uh, intuition judgments that materials researchers would be able to make. So in this case, we just did a PCA on the, the embeddings for uh, a few metals, their principal oxides and their ground state crystal structures. So in this case, you can see there's very clearly, there's a direction for the concept of oxide of, where you can take it from one, one vector or one, one source from, you just add that vector onto zinc and it takes you right to zinc's principal oxide. Similarly, there's a direction in this vector space for structure of, the ground state crystal structure of. And, and so this is, just, this is just PCA. So this information has been embedded in this high dimensional vector space in a way that you can do math on it now, which I think is a really, um, really fun kind of interesting uh, result from this, uh, this process of just creating word embeddings for, for materials. Um, so I thought it might be fun to, to pit some of the materials science uh, experts in the room uh, up against our, our model. So this is a, a test or a, a, a training example. Um, so that, that the task is to do some of these analogies that are material science based. So helium, or HE is to helium as blank is to iron. Go ahead and shout it out. All right. So we're doing, we're doing good so far. So let's, let's get into the real test. Okay, so pressure minus PA plus HZ. Okay. Al2O3 minus Al plus zinc. All right. Lithium cobalt oxide minus cathode plus anode. So what's the anode in lithium ion batteries? PCC minus Fe plus La. So this is the point at which I lose the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> DHCP, diamond hexagon goes back. Uh, zinc blend minus gallium phosphate plus gallium nitride. So what's the structural name of gallium nitride? And, I, and this is all output from our, our model. This isn't uh, just self-constructed data. So our model really does this. Um, How cherry picked are these? These were the first ones that we sort of came to mind. So sometimes there's a, there's a couple examples where it will not give you the correct answer, but the second one will be the correct answer, and the first one will be like reasonable, right? So, yeah. So, have you tried to start with a formula for superconducting low temperature 
complex, and then plus 300 kelvins minus. <laughs> I think you'll find a hole in the word in that. <laughs> yeah, so one thing is we remove the numbers because that would create a vocabulary that was too big to deal with. So, uh, right at this point with these embeddings, we can't do that yet. But uh, we are working on models that can. So, so, essentially, what you're asking is is there a regression in this high dimensional vector space where you can project out along a direction? and then ask it a similar question further along in that idea like direction. So that, that is something you can start doing with these, yeah. Uh, what type of model is that one that can deal with numbers? Um, What's the name? That is creating the embeddings? It's called word to -Bec. No, no, I oh. mean, you mentioned now that you're using a model that can deal with numbers. Oh, oh, uh, that one, it doesn't have a name. We're, we're creating it ourselves, oh. yeah. And you said that you removed numbers because the vocabulary was too big because word to -Bec cannot Numbers. Yeah, so word to vec doesn't really care what you give it. You could give it uh, random emojis and it would still uh, understand that that's just a uh, position in the vocabulary. So it works in any language. It works in respect, irrespective of like what kind of characters you give it. Um, each token, if it's unique, gets a position in the vocabulary. It just gets an index. And then word to vec just looks at the, the indices that occur together and produces probability distributions over those indices. Um, so when you're dealing with numbers, if you want to think about those numerically, that's different than a word, right? They have some under, they have structure themselves that is larger than just like a unique sequence of, of characters. And so you have to start building models that think a little bit differently about, about numbers. Um, also, this is the year of the periodic table. It's almost over. So we're going to lose our periodic table after this year, I guess. Um, but the, the, the main, um, or the birth of the periodic table really came when a group of researchers uh, and scientists started seeing structure in the elements and then started making some judgments about what order could you put them in in this structure. And then uh, Dmitry Mendeleev made a really fundamental jump in that process when he actually laid them out and left spots open for ones that he thought would be there. Um, and it turns out he was correct. He, he correctly predicted a number of, of elements that, uh, that hadn't been discovered to that point but did exist. Um, so we asked our model to do a similar thing. Uh, we know that it somehow has some structure that it's built. And so we asked it, can you just, in, in two dimensions, plot the, the periodic table? Uh, well, we asked it to put all the positions of the word embeddings for the elements. Um, and we were really pleased and sort of surprised to see that it was actually preserving sort of the structure of the periodic table itself. So you can see on the, the top left, you, you see a lot of the, um, the lighter elements in the bottom right, they get heavier. Uh, you can see that all the lanthanides are, are grouped together, transition metals are grouped together. Um, and so this was a, we were really pleased to see this because it sort of was, the, the periodic table is based on some fundamental physical properties of the elements. And this was being, this was being represented in the, the data of the, the word embeddings that, that had learned, been learned from just the way that scientists talk about the elements. Um, so I actually was up late one night um, before a conference and I started just playing around with this plot. And I thought it might be interesting, why don't I just start with zinc and draw an arrow through the, the, the column and, and do the same process and just connect the dots in this, this two-dimensional uh, T-SNE warped view of that high-dimensional vector space. Um, and so I started doing this and I, I, I saw, oh, that, that kind of connects up, that's, that's a little neat. What if I do it for the next one and the next one and the next one? So I'm just gonna step through the periodic table um, and drawing a line through the columns of the transition metals here. And that's being going to be represented on the, the T-SNE plot. And so when I saw this, I got really excited because this essentially says that the word embeddings almost truly reconstructed the periodic table um, in this higher dimensional vector space. And the reason it's kind of a warped donut shape uh, in this vector space is because T-SNE is taking a 200 dimensional vector space and putting it onto 2D which is very hard to do, but it tries to, to maintain the nearest neighbor relationships. Um, and so things get worked around a bit, but the nearest neighbors sort of stick together and you can create, have, uh, preserve some of that structure. So I think that this is pretty strong evidence that the mental model that the word to vec uh, process learned from the, just the, science, the body of scientific text is very similar to the real structure of the periodic table. So we're extracting useful, real scientific information out of the text, not just grammatical relationships, but, but real fundamental properties of things. Um, yeah, sure. So 
TCA is one particular algorithm for doing a low dimensional projection, mm -hmm. and there are others, and there's also hyperparameters yeah. involved when you do these projections. How robust are these relationships to you know, different methods used for the projection? Because clusters can be a little bit misleading sure. when, you, when you project down, and you, have, you can have a cluster split really far across yeah. space. So. Yeah, so it actually uh, preserves pretty well. So you can actually just uh, sort of do a similar process by just redoing the analogies for above on the periodic table and left and right. Um, we haven't run, we haven't built these periodic tables with uh, a lot of the other methods we can do for, for that um, projection, but uh, my suspicion is it would be very consistent uh, as far as like the, the, the mental model. But the, the key takeaway here really isn't that it can reconstruct the periodic table. It's more that it learned something very similar to the periodic table just from text which is kind of a, a fundamental thing. Um, one here and then one here. I didn't have to ask okay, you so I, I was so, I mean, just, If you start with this first arrow, you have four elements. Have you looked in your work to like, what is in between there? Is there something else? That between them? Yeah, between the two hmm. elements. There, there, uh, there might be, yeah. I'm not really sure off the top of my head what, what is in there. Um, so these, these, this, this vector space is really, really like funky, and I can't really imagine a 200 dimensional vector space. But um, I do, I do, I can look. Go on. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, so we, we actually have this as a web app that you can try out. Um, I think that the word embedding cloud uh, that we had, we had it in 3D. Um, that might not be up on the website anymore, but we can, we can like make that available if you're curious. So send us an email, we can actually give it to you. It's called a new element. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, the, the Tony Stark method from the Iron Man 3 or whatever, where he's throwing elements together. Um, yeah, so, so actually, if you, if you do a very simple uh, linear regression model on the word embeddings themselves, and you compare that to the actual uh, electronegativities and covalent radius of the, the elements, um, our model does, does a pretty good job of reconstructing that data just from text, right? It doesn't understand numbers, right? It, it's, it's based only on the way that scientists are writing about elements and, and materials. Um, and so uh, the R squared values are, are pretty linear with respect to the, the known and predicted by the model. Um, and so this is sort of a, we're not putting too much weight on this as the word embedding should be that your next great feature for, for um, the word to back word embedding should be the next great feature for your, your machine learning model, but useful chemical information is being learned by word to back just from reading text. So that's, that's like kind of the key takeaway here. We actually have some new models that we're developing that do produce uh, um, inputs for machine learning models that can help you beat the state of the art in terms of predicting formation energies. And that kind of thing. So that, that's something that we're going to be publishing about um, in the next year or so, I think. Um, so we can create a map of the space materials now with this, with this method. And so uh, if you look here in the thermoelectrics um, cluster, you can see that there are the, all the, the, the key player materials in there, like lead telluride, a um, bunch of other, uh, other well-known thermoelectrics. Um, so you can actually do a kind of neat operation on word embedding clouds like this. You can do a projection. So if you look at the, the, just the cosine similarity or essentially the, the dot product between vectors, uh, you can project that, that the, the similarity of a word onto the, all of the materials all at once by just doing that operation for all of them and then, and then coloring them based on their cosine similarity. So this is how the cluster of materials lights up for the word thermoelectric, so it's similarities. There's a, there's a central cluster in the, in the middle, but there's also some, some kind of orbiting clusters of thermoelectrics in kind of different chemical spaces. You can do this for luminescent, perovskite, any word that you're really interested in. Um, you can also look and see what is the, the breakdown about, like how does composition seem to influence things like organic or battery? So what the, given the materials that are most similar to this, this word, what is the, the actual composition, um, like a histogram of composition for those? You see organic, you, you, the, you see things like carbon and hydrogen. Batteries seem to have a lot of oxygen and oxides are very popular. Lithium, which is you know, a very common um, working, uh, elect, uh, working ion. Um, also thermoelectrics, you can see that there's like rare earths and things like that in there. So, so this starts giving you a perspective of how does composition seem to be influencing the, um, the properties of materials and what they can be used for. Okay, so there was a question earlier uh, about can, can we actually learn anything new from this though, right? So it's, lear it's, it's grabbed stuff from the, the literature and maybe it's like telling us what we've already learned about materials and that's neat. But can we actually use any of this to discover something new? Um, 
And this is a question that we were asking ourselves too. And then we, we very pleasantly uh, kind of came to the conclusion that like, yes, you can. Um, and so we have a paper that was published a few months ago um, uh, in which we sort of describe how we went about doing this, but I'm gonna go into it here. So uh, we already know that the word vectors that we've created can uh, relate mirror materials by the similarity of their word embeddings. Um, so we thought, well, what if we ask a question, what materials are very similar to a useful application, but never actually occurred in text together with that word? So uh, Anima Jane's group, who, who he's the lead on the Matt Scholar project, uh, they have a lot of data on thermoelectric materials. They work on discovering thermoelectrics with uh, high throughput density functional theory and, and machine learning and stuff like that. Uh, so they have a nice set of thermoelectric power factors that they've calculated for a lot of materials. So we asked the question, what materials are very similar to the word thermoelectric, but never co-occur in any abstracts in our data set with the word thermoelectric, CBEC, ZT, any of these words that would indicate that somebody has actually studied that material as a thermoelectric material. Um, and we found actually that uh, we could do this. Um, there were a lot of materials. So if you, if you go down the list of uh, materials that in similarity to thermoelectric, the 326th material never occurs in a document with thermoelectric. So what we did is we took the, the top 10 or so uh, suggestions in this ordering of the, the similarity with thermoelectric. And we plotted that against the thermoelectric power factors that the Jane group had calculated for a really large number, like 20,000, uh, uh, oh, it looks like 40,000 materials. Um, and then we also had a set of known thermoelectrics that, that from that set. So we, we looked in the literature and what materials had been mentioned as thermoelectrics in our, in our corpus. And when you actually plot the, the power factors for the materials that our model is suggesting, um, to the, 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 the power factors for the materials that, that the Jane group had calculated, um, we found that the top 10 were not only better than just the, the large number of calculations that they'd done in, in, in average, uh, the average thermoelectric power factor, but also the average thermoelectric power factor of known thermoelectrics. So these were, these were materials that the Jane group had made a calculation for, but that had never occurred in the literature. Um, so this was a promising result, but we wanted to see uh, you know, does this meet up, match up to just the experimental values of the actual thermoelectric um, figure of merit for these materials? So we, we found another data set uh, that had a few hundred um, thermoelectric figures of merit in them. And then a few of these uh, were in all of the sets that we've, we've calculated or that we've, we've made predictions for with the word -to -vec model. Um, and we actually found that the, the, the rank correlation, so just ordering the materials based on the word embedding similarity of thermoelectric is a better, in, it's a better predictor for the actual th thermoelectric figure of merit than just the power factor. So the figure of merit is, the power factor is a large um, input to that figure of merit, but it's not the only thing. The thermal conductivity is also very important. And so uh, our model seems to capture more information than just the thermoelectric power factor can uh, in terms of making predictions about whether something is thermoelectric or not. Um, so this was a, a really nice um, result that we we'd like, wanted to dig into deeper and see, is this really like doing what we think it's doing? Um, so uh, we, we then sort of did a, we did a holdout set where let's say, let's, let's throw out all the papers published after 2008, retrain the model, and then see would it, what would it say about the next 10 years of material science? So that, that uh, essentially we're asking, can you predict what scientists are gonna discover in the next 10 years? Um, so we took the, the this, this plot shows the first five materials in, the, in those, predi those uh, predictions in 2008. Had this model existed back then, uh, it made some predictions. The, I think these materials are thermoelectric, but nobody's studied them as that. And actually, a number of those were some of the best thermoelectrics discoveries in the next 10 years. So in this case, this copper gallium uh, telluride, uh, it took four years or so until a paper that mentions that this has a thermoelectric, or this is a good thermoelectric material was published. Um, and then the next, the next two took up to like, almost 10 years uh, to actually be confirmed as thermoelectrics. And then if we look at these, these two that, that weren't really, uh, were never discovered as thermoelectrics, were never published about, um, they both contain toxic or rare elements that if you asked an experimental collaborator, you say, I predicted this great thermoelectric, it, it's mercury zinc telluride, they're, <laughs> they're not gonna wanna work with that material because it's not gonna be, um, it's not gonna really be applied. Uh, so there's one group at MIT Media Lab that's working on thermoelectrics for, uh, wearable technologies. And they, they have a thermoelectric underwear that they're trying to develop that would power your wearables. And if that had mercury in it, I don't think many people would be buying that underwear. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, but we can repeat this not just for the top five, but for the top 50, and then look and see every year, let's retrain this model. Um, and so this, this plot shows we, we start in 2000 with data from two, before 2000 to, to 2000, look at the top 50 materials, and then the, the, the gray lines, they, they, each year we, we count up how many materials were confirmed from that set to be thermoelectric. So it's just the percentage of con confirmed predictions. And then we redo this for every year. So that, that red line is sort of the, the average, like after nine years on average, uh, just about 20% of the predictions from the top 50 are confirmed to be thermoelectric materials. Um, one of the properties that's kind of key for a thermoelectric is that it has, it's not metallic. It's, it has a great band gap that's greater than zero. So we can just use that as sort of a rough heuristic. So our model not only does better than just selecting materials at random, but it's, it does better than selecting materials based on this sort of uh, heuristic that is very commonly used when looking for new thermoelectric materials. Um, so within five years, materials are six times more likely to be discovered from the top 50 of our predictions than they are just from picking at random. Um, this also works for, for many more materials classes than just thermoelectrics. We've redone this for photovoltaic, uh, ferroelectric, um, topological insulators, and, and they all show very similar trends of the predictions from the model are much, much higher, much more likely to be discovered within the next few years than just picking materials at random. So, so we wanted to know how this could work, right? This, this is a really interesting result, and like we, we wanted to investigate, you know, what is the model actually doing to make these predictions? Is this reasonable? And so, uh, one way you, you could do this is just look at the the predictions it's making, and then plot the words that are most similar to both thermoelectric and that word. So this plot shows the the thicker the line, the more similar that those two those two words are, according to the model. And so. We sort of, there are, there are kind of a couple ways that the model seems to be making suggestions. Uh, one is that a material may be mentioned with properties that are very closely associated with thermoelectricity. So in this case, it's it may be a hoister compound with an indirect band gap. Uh, and those, those, those tokens that are being mentioned together might start pulling that material sort of closer to thermoelectric. Um, another case we have uh, where a material may be mentioned in, in a study with other materials that are later discovered to be thermoelectric. So they, they were chemically similar in some way and studied together for that reason. And then later materials may be discovered to be thermoelectrics. And so this is sort of a, a discovery that we've missed. We just, we just haven't made it yet. Um, we, it, it fell through the cracks. Um, in another case, they may be used for an application where the properties of that material are very similar. Like the, the requirements for that application are similar in properties. So photovoltaic materials and thermoelectric materials have a lot of overlap in the properties that would make them um, useful for that application. Uh, yeah, so we've done this for, for ferroelectrics, photovoltaics, and they're all pretty nice curves that, that allow you to potentially accelerate the rate of discovery of some of these materials. Um, so we wanted to test whether these embeddings could be used as inputs to other machine learning models, and I kind of alluded to that a little bit before. So one, one example, there's this, um, this paper that was actually inspired by WordDevec to create embeddings for elements based on the crystals, the, their occurrence in crystal structures together. So they call it um, atom to I think, or elm to But uh, that is essentially they're using density functional theory structures and, and that are based on physics. And they're, they're looking at the co-occurrence of the, the elements together and they're creating some sort of representation of the elements from that like hard data, uh, like structured data about materials. Um, so what we did is we used the exact same method as them for creating a neural network that, to predict the formation energy, but we just gave it the embeddings of the elements from our text model. So this is just, it learned these representations from just the text and the way elements are used. And uh, we actually improve on their error, their, their prediction error for formation energy, just from composition for El Paso light structures. So you just take the, it's like ABCD um, element. Uh, with, with different stoichiometry, or with the specific stoichiometry. You just concatenate those, those embeddings together and then feed that to a very simple neural network and it predicts the formation energy. Um, so we use the same model as them, but our embeddings seem to contain more useful features uh, that were um, to, to make that prediction. Um, so I'm just about out of time. Uh, I want to leave a couple moments for questions. Oh, sorry, I see, yeah. What was the difference between their, their method and your method? Mm -hmm. Did they use a neural network on a word embedding that was specific to chemistry words and you used a word embedding that was based on abstracts? Is that? No, so, so they didn't use word embeddings. They, they, what they did is they took, uh, say that their crystal structure of silicon oxide, uh, their, their 
are is a certain distribution of silicon and oxygen being there. And they, they looked at the way that those uh, very, well, like from hundreds of thousands of crystal structures, how do atoms uh, co-occur in the structures together? So they did a very similar process of, given an atom, how likely is another atom to be in the site okay, next to so it? Okay, so it's still, a, it's a representation of the atom in some embedding space based on co-occurrence in molecules. Mm -hmm. Whereas yours is yeah. a co-occurrence of words in abstracts. In text, yeah. yeah. Same, but fed into the same. Same model, same model. machine okay. learning model, yeah. So we just wanted to compare how useful are our features against the features they learned from the real information. Um, and so ours seems to be able to capture a little bit broader sense of elements. Um, yeah, that's cool. the kind of what we thought from it. Um, so I wanted to, to give some credit to the people that, that built all of these tools and, and these techniques. So Vahe was the lead author on the Nature paper. Um, he's not Google. Um, he was a postdoc in Garrett Sater's group. Lee Weston was a postdoc in Anubhav's, uh, Anubhav Jain's group at, here at LVNL. Um, and he's not Medium. So Amelie Trewartha is now the, the postdoc contributor from the Sater group. Uh, also Alex Dunn and Victoria uh, by Bakova, our graduate students in Anubhav Jane's group, and then I'm in Christine Pearson's group uh, here at LVNL. Um, and we also, uh, so our funding comes from the Toyota Research Institute, and uh, we also are hosting our, our interactive web app uh, for the Matt Scholar Project on SPIN uh, at NERSC, and so we really appreciate that service. Um, and I think that it's going to be a very uh, influential force in data gateways going forward, coming out of, especially coming out of LVNL. Seems like a lot of people are jumping on this and, and really finding it useful. Um, and then also, uh, Zinking Rong helped us get some of our data from web scraping. Uh, Olya Kononova built the parser that allows us to normalize the, the chemical formulas. So if you write AL203 or O3 AL2, it gets normalized to the same thing. And that it requires a lot of, um, of rule-based, uh, just blood, sweat, and tears, figuring out how material names occur. And also Matt, Matt Horton was a, a key contributor uh, at the early stages of, of developing the ideas that we were using. Yep. Um, so thank you very much. You can find me on Twitter and follow our progress at JM Dagdalen if you want. Uh, and I'm also happy to take any questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Also, if there are any questions from the people on stream, um, we can maybe take those first. Okay. Any questions on Zoom? Can somebody, uh, maybe over there, turn on their speaker because I think there's a feedback going on from this. Um, what for? We can hear the sound. The, there are speakers. Oh, there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Maybe not. If somebody else, we should hear it. Okay. Question. We can start. Talking about the kind of pre-processing of the original data. Mm -hmm. Um, did you guys kind of split by sentences or just take the full abstract as a giant one mass of text? And what distance from the target word were you looking before and after? Yeah, so for the word devec, we split on sentence, and then I think our window size is eight or something, so we look uh, like four on each side, essentially. Um, for the NER, uh, I think that we look, that, that happens at, a, um, at an abstract level, I, I believe. And that, that one also has a window size that goes in the LSTM. Um, I'm not sure if that is being cut off at sentences or not, but I can look that up for you if you want. Um, so the yeah. NER, does that, does that cover multi-word phrases? Yeah, so we, we created uh, tokens, or essentially, we, we looked and found all multi-word phrases used more than five times become their own tokens. Um, so we found that that was useful for creating higher, higher quality um, embeddings for, for the word embeddings. Yep. And then for the, the NER, you can actually also label token sequences that should belong together. So like. Uh, um, maybe x-ray diffraction pattern would be one thing, one entity you'd like to get. So you can actually label uh, the beginning of an entity, middle, middle, and then they get joined afterwards. Yep. Hey, it's, uh, it's Marcin on Zoom. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sure. Yeah, I just, I just have a quick question uh, regarding uh, the, I guess, the, the sentences that produce uh, your associations. Mm -hmm. Do you actually, do you have access to those? Do you expose the, uh, the literature data, I guess, that supports the different embeddings? Yeah, unfortunately, we can't, uh, we can't redistribute the abstracts themselves, that data. Um, so that, that's for copyright reasons. The, the owners of the, the data uh, request that people get that through their subscriptions to the, those services, like Scopus. But we've done our best to make it as easy as possible for people to recreate our data set. So we have a list of all of the DOIs that were used in the original training. And then we've, we've uh, made 
codes on our GitHub repos that will allow you, given if you have a Mongo, da Mongo database set up, you can just point it at that and then it'll start scraping the, the same data uh, from the papers that we used and put it in there for you. Um, so that you can, uh, if you have a subscription to that content and you're allowed to, to text mine it, uh, you can recreate our results. So, so I we have like one question in the room, so. Uh, ask you about, about your thoughts about moral aspect of your work. Mm. In the sense that, especially your last few slides show that the predictive power is very strong of your tool. Mm. So I, I can easily imagine a situation that the person who is reviewing grants for different people will consult your web page and then make a decision which proposal is most likely to succeed or not. Mm. So if you are so successful, you will be used mm. in this way. So, so in some sense, uh, any things you can do accidentally wrong still will be will, may have a large consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really good um, point. Uh, I think that we've over the recent years we've seen a lot of instances where people made something they thought would be great and useful, and then it gets misused in, in ways that they didn't intend and can have some some large consequences. Um, one one way I see it is that. Uh, the way, like one way you can you can de-risk technologies as you build them is to make them available to everybody in equal uh, usability. So a lot of times, a lot of the data that we produce online gets misused by by entities that have capabilities that the average consumer doesn't, the average researcher doesn't. So uh, on the other side, if you if you make a tool where researchers can use exactly the same tools that these grant uh, evaluating agencies would would potentially use for their their work, they can benefit from the technology and use it to augment their own work. So hopefully by, we're, we're really making an effort to not just produce tools that are on GitHub and not actually like usable by researchers from all walks of, of uh, the community. Uh, we're trying to make tools where, where they're accessible through web portals that uh, everyday users can get the same benefit from this, this technique uh, and also use it to suggest, you know, what directions are most promising in their work? How, how is it gonna be evaluated in terms of these tools? Um, but that, that that's something that I think that we benefit from having conversations with the larger research community, um, not just keeping in our silos and working on these tools, but actually getting out there and sharing what we're doing with others and hearing their thoughts. So um, to that, I would, I would almost want to hear what you all have to think about that. Um, you know, what areas might we not have thought about or how can you imagine this technology being used that, that maybe we, we haven't considered yet. So I think that uh, we're very open to hearing that information. We actually set up a forum for uh, our, all of our tools so that people can have discussions around them. Um, it's at matsci.org. So if you're interested in, in uh, we'd be interested in hearing your views on that. We can actually start some, some forum uh, topics on, along those lines and, and try to get ahead of the curve on how, how these things might be used so that we can make sure that we're, we're not accidentally biasing our models towards uh, preferring papers on graphene and not um, things on, on other types of materials or something like that. Yeah, so hopefully that, that sort of addresses uh, how, you, how we might use specifically for our tools. Um, in a larger sense, though, I think that materials researchers are going to be increasingly using tools like, uh, like these. So machine learning based on learning from some larger data sets that they didn't create just themselves, but are sort of community sourced. Um, and and ch the chess models, I don't know if any of you are familiar with like the, the machine learning for Go and chess and stuff. but. Uh, in the 80s, the, the AI started beating humans in chess. And so everybody thought this might be the end of chess, essentially, because no, no human would ever be able to beat an AI again. But what they, they found is that when a human and an AI play together, they're able to beat almost every AI, uh, almost, every, oh, almost always. So a human plus an AI is better than just even the best AI. And, and they call these centaurs, uh, this, a, a, a team of an AI and a, and a chess player. Uh, being a centaur when they play against each other. And so the best chess players in the world are the team between an AI and a human. And I think as we look forward, the best scientists in the world are going to be a partnership between re teams of researchers, human researchers, and, and AI tools that they can use to answer questions more efficiently or see out beyond their own uh, area of expertise and maybe help them make connections to other areas of research that they're not necessarily familiar with at the same level. Um, so hopefully that, that this is a the tool that it's not going to replace materials researchers it's not going to replace uh, the intuition that they have hopefully it's going to augment the abilities of, of researchers to be able to do more and and make even bigger discoveries so yeah uh any more questions just one more 
Do you think that there's a more opportunity for bias or variability in the word to that embedding space that you create from your data set or in the uh, neural networks that you train upon it? Um, definitely. So uh, when we train a neural network on labeled data from a single researcher, uh, it's going to be biased towards that one researcher's opinions on those, on those topics. So the categories that we've chosen, material, property, descriptor, those are sort of, there's still, we, we, we went months trying to figure out what these labels should be and what their definition should be, but there's still some ambiguity and some edge cases. So, so essentially the, the model encodes that one researcher's opinion about that stuff. So that can, that can uh, introduce some bias. Um, the word embeddings though, they can, they can encode bias in a little subtler way that may not be as obvious. So uh, one thing is, you know, we, we have this plot showing we're predicting future discoveries, but we're not necessarily predicting the physical properties of these materials. Like that's not the task it was trained to do. It was trained to, to recreate what researchers said about materials. So essentially what this model learns to do is predict what researchers are gonna do in the future. So that's a very like different thing than just predicting. So if there's areas of science that we have no data on, this model cannot necessarily give us any um, insight into areas it has no experience with. Uh, it might be able to help make connections that sort of could be used to project a bit out into that, but we really need to uh, be careful about how we use models that uh, we can't extend them too far out into ranges that we don't have training data for because your model is, is recreating a, um, a statistical function of some kind in a, in a certain range. And, and if you use it to project out outside of that range, you may be breaking the assumptions that it was using when it was making uh, evaluations. That's one thing we need to think about. But can we learn from the mistakes? Like, mm -hmm. if there's like, if we have like trends where we're like, you know, trying out certain things and then it's like a dead end in research, is that available? Like, yeah, so uh, that, that the, the question was, can we learn from mistakes and also uh, use, uh, you know, we, we try a lot to develop uh, material for this property with this chemistry and it just doesn't work out, right? Um, so right now we don't actually have great sets of data for failed experiments, which would be really useful. And I think everybody, any science scientist you ask says, this would be really awesome to have, but nobody's sort of doing like contributing that data. So I don't personally know what the solution to that problem will be. Um, there are a couple of journals, like the journal of, uh, null, the journal of the null hypothesis or something, I think is one of them. Um, that, those are really nice trends that people are starting to think about this. Um, I think once, so these, these tools sort of are, are projecting towards a direction where you can just dump all of your research output and like you write reports for your PI about experiments you've done and they didn't work out and you write that. Um, if we can just have like a repository where you just dump all of your stuff like that and, and can contribute back to research, maybe it's tools like this that can work on unstructured data, might be able to start making sense of those and then people wouldn't have to spend months of their life to write up a negative result which won't get any citations. Um, and so maybe they'll have a place to put it at least. Um, so. Yeah. Thank you again. Let's thank John one more time.